and welcome back to our next episode of Big Data Talks, in which we are having conversations with industry experts in, about the way in which data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are changing the way we live. My name is Jan Willem Middelburg, and I will be your host today. I'm the author of the Enterprise Big Data Framework, which is hosting this series of Big Data Talks. You can always watch back the recording on this discussion on YouTube, the Big Data Framework website, and the podcasting platform on Apple Podcasts. I am thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Ibrahim Teba, who is joining me from Lebanon today. Dr. Ibrahim is a lecturer at the American University in Beirut, teaching in project management, management information systems, quantitative methods, and technology management. Additionally, he's an accredited instructor of the Enterprise Big Data pr Framework programs. Dr. Kebe retrieved his doctorate from Hokkaido University in Japan and is a doctor in systems and information engineering. It's really a great pleasure to have so much experience here today. Welcome to Big Data Talks, Dr. Kebe. Thank you. Dr. Kebe, it's really um, a great pleasure to see you here on the show today, and thanks so much for taking the time to participate today. I would like to start today's discussion with a very simple question. How did you become involved in the domain of big data? Uh, it's a long story, but to keep it short, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know that <clears throat> every, roughly every five years, uh, there is a new generation of research in, in academia. And originally, I'm, I'm an academic. So uh, every five years, something changes. Uh, lots of things change. So uh, when it comes to AI, for example, it has gone through three changes. Now we are living in the wake of the third uh, wave. On the other hand, <clears throat> the reliance on information has actually shifted to reliance on data, especially when we talk about big data. And that actually drew my attention into going there because before I used to analyze data, for example, using classical, um, you know, uh, statistical or even heuristic uh, algorithm. But later on, when big data became available, it was actually out of the question to leave it that way. I mean, it had to be exploited. And that's what brought me. Absolutely. So one of the things and the reasons that I invited you for today's show is that I've read some of your research and I've, I've seen that you've been using different forms of algorithms already uh, when you did your PhD and in, in some of the other um, uh, studies that you've been conducting. So we'll come back towards that within uh, uh, later in, in uh, today's interview, because I do really think that that is um, providing some good background around the way that people who might be, uh, become interested in pursuing data can retrieve that. Before I, however, dive into I, your personal I, history a little bit more, there is always um, one main question, which is basically the, the, the main topic of today's show. And that is, what is your view on how big data is changing the world around us? How is it changing the world? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you can forget about privacy, more or less. Uh, <laughs> we are being exposed. We are really, really, we are being exposed at every level. Uh, when you know, for example, that uh, you can be classified and uh, uh, being put within the history of a recommender system, uh, this is a bit, you know, apprehensive. You get very a little bit apprehensive. But when you look at the potential of that, it's amazing. Uh, we can actually have inferences on things we have never had the chance to have inferences on. We can tackle very complex problems that we couldn't tackle before despite the fact that we had the technology, but that technology maybe wasn't too fast, wasn't too efficient. And most importantly, thirdly and most importantly, well, now we are bold enough to try new things, the things that we, that we haven't tried before. And that is only availed by, uh, by big data, simple as that. I fully agree with you. I think um, it's this constant trade-off that, you, you, that we would need to make. And, and you mentioned two very interesting points. On the one hand, big data can solve a lot of the world's most pressing problems. Uh, on the other hand, what you mentioned, we might need to give up some of our privacy uh, because of classification algorithms and all kinds of other ways in which the data systems are using the information around us. 
If I make up the balance there, do you think that the benefits weigh up against the cost? I guess so. I guess so. Otherwise, uh, there would be an outcry. I mean, the consumer is not complaining. Uh, the prosumers or the professionals are not complaining as well because uh, they are finding, you know, it's, it's like when you have a new toy and you take it to bed with you. <laughs> Just keep it close to you as much as you can. So we are happy with that. Yeah, so... I know that you are a, a, an expert in the domain of algorithms, so you know how these systems work. However, what I always found in, in a lot of my conversations is that most people are not fully familiar or knowledgeable around the way that these algorithms have the, the, the ability um, and also the power to steer behavior. If we were to make this more public, do you think that uh, the revolt would happen? Or do you think that ultimately there is going to be more benefits for everyone um, and that uh, people are comfortable giving up a little bit of privacy in return for, let's say, better health care or better quality of life? What is your, your personal thoughts on that? I guess so, because when you talk about, uh, let's say, for example, uh, those who are considered to be conspiracy uh, you know, theorists, the conspiracy theory um, works as far as, uh, you know, uh, insisting on privacy. But the thing is that uh, we cannot not communicate and we cannot give up part of our privacy for the sake of the benefits of the overall benefits. This is on one hand. On the other hand, uh, going public about it requires simplification. When you are talking to, to, uh, to the layperson, you need to simplify the, uh, the, the ideas as much as possible. So maybe instead of uh, using uh, the word algorithm, because as you know, these words, they catch up and they, when they, for example, become part of the movie pop culture, uh, they take up the, a wrong turn. They take up a wrong turn. For, so for example, when, everybody, when anybody hears about AI, they directly think the Terminator, for example. <laughs> or uh, they think the matrix. I mean, we are m very, very far away from that. I mean, uh, the machines are not going to take over the, the planet. Uh, I mean, it is already taken over by worse people. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, the point is that it's a very important thing to consider this from the viewpoint of literacy. This is what I'm suggesting. Since I'm working in the education sector, uh, literacy is the key. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm giving now at AUB, at the American University of Beirut, a course on statistics. Uh, I spend extra time explaining to my students the idea behind data, the philosophy of data on one hand. On the other hand, the rationale of problems. Why are we interested in solving these problems? Because that would actually uh, establish a culture. This is what we need to do. We need to establish a culture in which they, big data becomes an, integ an integral part so integrating big data in uh, in our culture, it's a it's a very important thing. On one hand, on the other hand, literacy statistics needs to become literacy, not simple because this is the the, the basis of uh, big data statistics. If you want to talk about the infrastructure, it has to become uh, literacy. It is not literacy yet. This is a big problem, and I, I have seen it in many many universities. The first thing that goes out of their head is statistics. So forget about that. <laughs> well, uh, I kind of regret not uh, having had the opportunity to be in your statistics class when I was in university, because when I studied myself, I always found that a lot of these uh, subjects are being taught in a very dry way. So it's all yes. about uh, learning, uh, you know, the, the, the formu formulas and the calculations and the way that algorithms are being composed without mm. looking at the meaning behind that. And I, I really yes. like the word that you're saying, literacy, uh, because that implies not just knowing and, and being able to, uh, you know, uh, repetitively reproduce all these formulas, but knowing mm. how to apply that and also what the power of these things can be. Um, yes. I'm always very interested, obviously, I'm in, in the big data domain uh, a lot. So um, there is, I would say, um, 50-50% overlap with the, the world of statistics. 
Um, do you think that the, the world of or the domain of statistics has evolved into what we now know today as data science, or do you still consider that two more separate disciplines? No, it's becoming blurry all the time. It's blurred. It actually started out with, uh, you know, that famous article uh, of John Tukey's. That was, yeah, uh, absolutely. that was amazing. That was a turning point. That was a turning point. Uh, that man was a visionary. And I rely much on his vision. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I actually uh, drifted into, uh, you know, big data because of that, uh, of that article. Uh, but other people have actually been ridiculed back in their time because of it. Like uh, John, uh, for example, George Danzig, the one who came up with the linear programming uh, system. They blamed him on the fact that it was considered to be linear. Why linear? I mean, uh, nature is not linear. Yes, nature is not linear. But you need to have a starting working component. Big data is just like that. It's like a second revolution. So well, I, uh, I, I fully agree there. And, and in order to be really a visionary, sometimes people do need to think you're a little bit crazy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, oh, as you know, uh, when I, know. I invited you to, uh, to be here on, on the podcast today, one of my um, main reasons why I thought uh, I would like to have this conversation to, with you today is that you are heavily, and I would say on a day-to-day -day basis, involved within the education industry. You obtained a PhD in systems and information engineering at Hokkaido University, which is a very long uh, way from Lebanon. How did you end up in Japan? Well, uh, when I was... Uh... Uh, was, I was back at AUB doing my final research, uh, preparing to, be grad, uh, to graduate. Uh, when I applied to the Mombusho Scholarship, uh, it's a Japanese uh, national scholarship for uh, PhD students. So <coughs> I, could, I have received like five acceptances, but I couldn't get there because uh, my professor, my supervisor delayed me. Uh, so I was delayed for a whole year. But one of these acceptances persisted. The man called me from Japan and said, when are you coming? I said, well, I thought it was over. He said, no, it's never over. Come as soon as you can. So there I was. And uh, when I realized that I am in a place where everybody are working on object-oriented programming, you know, there were programmers all around me. I said, what do you need a mechanical engineer? I was a mechanical engineer by profession. What do you need a mechanical engineer? He said, all of these guys are actually programmers. They don't have the capability of modeling. They can find the solution to any problem if it is already modeled. But the problem is that the problem is not going to model itself. This is why we need you. And he said that 20 years ago, he was saying that 20 years ago, he was also a mechanical engineer and he made that jump. And the, and, and the matter of fact, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the name, the title of, uh, you know, systems and information engineering, where in fact, it was about, meta, about uh, heuristics applied in autonomous systems, autonomous complex uh, systems. And that was my training in the, in the PhD. And that led from, you know, one place to the other until I reached where I am today. So this that very, was the reason why I went story. to Japan. Yeah, one, one of the things that really starts me thinking is, uh, is what you just mentioned is that there is such a big difference between programming and modeling. And I, I, I fully yes. agree with you because one is just the, the more execution of something that somebody else already made, whereas the modeling part is completely around creativity, thinking about a different way to do things and also looking at all kinds of extreme conditions of what can go wrong uh, if, if you're testing the yes. limits. Yes. What are kind of the most... Um, I would say important lessons or one of the, the, the key challenges that you encountered when you were confronted with dealing with people who had mostly a programming background? Well, uh, first of all, uh, everything to them was deterministic. They didn't allow for uh, chance. They didn't allow for, uh, you know, uh, miscalculations or even even you know aberrations um, I told them that in modeling modeling is all about compromise it's all about compromise the more you compromise you give the faster you are going to get to your uh, target but in fact you would sacrifice some of the precision 
you would sacrifice some of the precision of some models in order to get a result and then use this result as a feedback to improve your original model so it's the kind of of a uh, you know a repetitive process an uh, iterative process this is something they didn't have you know they didn't have in mind i mean they can iterate as much as you want within a uh, for, uh, you know within a for loop for example yeah. uh, for two loop but uh, iterating models that was a totally new concept to them i mean it's all built around the assumptions that you make the more assumptions the simpler the, the model then when it works then take out one assumption and work on it if you look yeah. at the process it is by nature it is agile it's an agile process the process of modeling and remodeling controlling the model it's agile so uh, this is the main difference yes so how did you take people on that journey because um um i fully agree with what you're saying in terms of this more deterministic versus a more creative approach which is a very difficult uh, thing to get people along in that journey um mm. from your experience how did you get people so far as to kind of change the way that they're thinking Mm. I used to tell them the story about the horse and the man. Uh, no, I'm a man and a horse. <laughs> a man and a horse uh, met together in a race. They were supposed to race together. So the man was racing the horse. My question to my students would be, uh, who is going to win, the man or the horse? Most of them would say the horse. I would say yes, eventually the horse is going to win. But if the race spans only 10 meters, the man is going to win. When you have two legs, you don't have, uh, you don't require much time to coordinate two legs in order to start off. But when you have four legs, then you need some time for coordination. So the man is going to win if it is a 10 meters uh, race. Otherwise, it's the horse. So all their job was to do, what to do is decide who is the man and who is the horse when they are confronted with a uh, with a model. That's the idea. Absolutely. So, so could, could you say that it's, it's all about perspective, whether you're looking at it from yes. which particular angle? Yes, yes. For example, could... if you are working on, um, uh, on inventory systems, uh, the easiest way to start an inventory system is to consider that your demand is constant. Work that way and look up your uh, economic order quantity. And then after that, you are free to you know, make the, all the variations that you need. But start simple. You all, we always need to start simple. You need to deliver something simple that works. Then you build on the results and you keep on improving until it is not worth to put any more time or money in the improvement. So this is the quality, the cost of quality. So when it doesn't yeah. make sense anymore, this is where you start. Well, I now kind of also start to understand why you mentioned that this is an agile pro process because you kind of, it's, it's a whole process of trial and error, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Good. I want to expand a little bit around your uh, doctoral dissertation. I'm always very interested in people who have done PhDs because it requires such an uh, amount of time and effort and commitment. Um, I, I frequently say to all the PhD candidates that I've spoken to, you know, you, you basically spend around 5% of your lifetime on, you know, writing this, doing this kind of research so with all the dedication that is involved. So before I kind of um, um, start asking you some questions around the content, can you, can you briefly describe what your dissertation was about? Yes. Uh, as I told you before, I was using uh, heuristic methods to uh, discover what is now called big data problems, like the traveling salesman problem, you know, NPR problems. And uh, I think my problem was uh, job shop scheduling and flow shop scheduling. Both of them are NP hard, especially job shop. In this case, I would be thinking about a method which, I will, which actually give me the best solution possible. So on one hand, I was prepared to sacrifice the quality by instead of having satisfaction, I would have satisfying, uh, you know, sufficient satisfaction by near you know near uh, optimal solutions like when i think like that when i think like that i have two two problems when it comes to these the methods some of them will not give you the solution it will give you the neighborhood of the solution and some of them would give you the solution but that solution would be a local optimum meaning it is it's like what it's an ant like an ant walking up a hill 
once it reaches the, the top of that hill, it looks around and finds out that there is another hill which is higher. So uh, this is the problem of locality. So what I did was I combined two methods. One of them is local, is very good, is very proficient at finding local solutions. And the other one, which is uh, energy-based, is very good at finding, uh, you know, uh, uh, generals or uh, global solutions. I combined them together and found the best solution. It's like this. You have multiple haystacks, and there is a needle in one of these haystacks. So the first thing I do, I uh, locate the haystack with the needle, and then I locate the needle within that haystack. So this is what I did. So, so can I say that you kind of invented a new algorithm? Yeah, it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid, in fact. It was the first time that was, these two methods were combined together. Good. Oh, that's really, that's very interesting. Um, could we say that at the time that you were doing that, that was already called machine learning or artificial intelligence, or was that still just the domain uh, of statistics? <laughs> uh, no, it's not statistics at all. They used to call it, I mean, the methods were generally heuristic methods. But ah. the process itself, the process of finding the solution was called reinforcement learning. There wasn't anything like machine learning back then. I'm talking uh, like uh, 25 years ago. So it wasn't called machine learning at all. It was called reinforcement learning. Yeah. Because you are Which forcing is still one your of the, the main to learn new... Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. At the core Good. of AI, yes. So I'm actually quite um, fascinated to learn that it's, you know, it has such a long history already, if you think about it and the fact that reinforcement learning was already called that back in the days. Exactly. I mean, if you think Before about Before I move it, on uh, to, to, towards our next segment, because I, I do really also want to talk to you a little bit more around your experience with one of your other great passions, which is project management. I just have one more time or one, one more question about your time in Japan, because that's so, so fascinating because and you're coming from a completely different part of the world, which is, I would say from a cultural perspective, milestones away from the culture in Japan. What were some of the most fundamental lessons that you learned, um, during that time abroad? Mm. Actually, I learned two very important things. Uh, first of all, I learned not to be afraid of learning on your own. I mean, I have graduated from my original alma mater, the American University, taught me to look for my own information, and they taught me how to express myself. But in Japan, you are really on your own. In the, fact, in the fact that your supervisor will support you with any book you can dream about, any book you want, you, can, you will get it. But forget about anybody coaching you. You need to actually work on yourself. You need to do your own research. So this is one. And two, and this is the most important lesson, the, the second lesson uh, was to be modest. Uh, my professor, he was, a, he was a big shot back then in Japan. Uh, he used to address himself uh, in his proper name. He didn't refer to himself as a doctor. And he used to do that, do that often. So I, I told him, I mean, uh, why do you do that? I mean, you are a doctor. You're supposed to, you know, put a title in front of your name. He said, well, if my title would do me any good, then I will use it. Otherwise, I'm just a person. I'm just a learner. So this type of modesty really touched me. And I, I, I like to think that, you know, uh, you know, it's very important to be modest. You cannot learn if you are not modest. This is what I got to, to, you know, to understand. Well, I think that's some, uh, some really great lessons already right there um, that I think a lot of our listeners can, uh, can take away uh, as sharing some of your life's lessons. Thanks so much for that. Um, I kind of want to move on towards um, the next major topic of this conversation um, because, you know, I always like to kind of structure these interviews into a couple of core aspects that we're going into a little bit more in, de in depth. Um, and one of the, the areas that you are also very well known for is your knowledge around project management. Um, and um, one of the key things that I wanted to talk to you a little bit more around is how can we uh, combine the domain of big data, which is all about algorithms, it's all about technology, 
but how can we also combine that with the world a little bit more around project management and the way that we take uh, think about lessons from a more management perspective or from a more planning perspective? First, so let me let me uh, uh, first uh, start um, uh, with with a very fundamental question. I think you already mentioned it a little bit um, uh, in uh, a couple of minutes ago. Is as far as my project management understanding goes, there's two major streams, which is the the more traditional or frequently referred to as the waterfall methodology, and then there is the whole concept of more agile ways. Which of these project management techniques uh, is most useful when we are reviewing uh, data and data sets? Uh, so, uh, when working with big data in general, the agile model is more convenient. Why? Because in agility, what you do is you work on iterations. They call them sprints. Sprints. So, uh, every sprint will give you a minimum viable product. So. If you were trying to use or utilize the uh, original uh, model, which is the what we call the waterfall model, well, the waterfall model is not going to uh, serve you much because it requires to have full planning ahead. Well, in big data, you can never plan everything ahead and then start executing. Uh, and definitely uh, applying controls on such systems is out of the question. This is why some of the most important uh, uh, let's say, for example, IT projects have been written off as uh, failed. So they say IT projects fail at a rate of 80%. Well, this is wrong. This is because it was looked at from a wrong perspective. So when I come to the big data, I realize that agility is the, is the key. Why? Because to begin with, you have a working, you know, you have a working model. O of course, uh, albeit it is not a perfect model, but it works. It gives you results. Mediocre results, but nevertheless, they are considered to be a start point. After that, you go to the next sprint. Usually, they, uh, rec uh, they recluse these sprints within one week to four weeks, for example. So the next sprint, you will make it better. Then the next sprint, you will make it better. Three, four sprints from that, you have the perfect product. But at every end of the sprint, you, can, you have actually an MVP, a minimum viable product. So I believe that actually works. In fact, I was working on a consultancy the other day. And uh, I have received, you, you wouldn't believe, I mean, tons of big data. And each one of these big data had, you know, you know, because of convenience. I mean, it was talking about something different. Some talking about demand without talking about prices at all. And some talking about revenues without talking about the units in demand and so on and so forth. So what I did was I treated each one of them as being separate from the other. I, deal, I dealt with it in sprints. And then, like uh, yesterday morning, they all converge together, just like that. You know, because of hard toiling, you know, and work, they converge together. And we had, I had something uh, today, this morning, I, I delivered my consultancy and it actually worked. Good, that's a very so interesting is insight. The, so, is the answer. Yes, yeah, so if, if I can summarize you a little bit, um, you would say that the, the, the more appropriate model is more around the agile way of working with the sprints where we can, um, uh, you know, over time iterates towards a more um, viable solution or a minimum viable product, uh, as you just called it. Um, I've yes. been working in the past yes. with yes. a lot of more, I would say, research oriented um, individuals um, and are within the research, especially within the data domain. There's always a lot of focus around what is known as reproducible research meaning that we can always follow the steps again, uh, explain what has been done so that mm. ultimately the result will showcase uh, that we know that it's valid. Is the, um, the agile methodology, is that not detrimental towards reproducible research or, or what, would be your, what would be your take on that? Uh, well, there are some, th some uh, artifacts, if you will, artifacts in the sense of uh, what we call um, templates or documents that are repeated across this type of projects. For example, you have the, uh, the requirements template, you have the storyboard, you need to have a storyboard. So you have all these uh, templates that actually help you correct your uh, direction on one hand. On the other hand, it will help you reproduce what you call a reproducible research, for example. It will help to reproduce other projects. 
So the lessons learned are always there. It, they are always there. They are like shadowing the process. The process is being shadowed by these lessons learned. So, uh, and it is gaining uh, quite some culture. It is gaining quite some culture around the world. And obviously, obviously, you will reach a place where you would stop working on this from the perspective of a project and start using it in operations. When you have enough templates and you have enough control on the inputs and the outputs. But until then, it needs to be agile and it needs to be undertaken through project management. This is the idea. Good. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you there. And I think most people who are in the data domain should really look at the knowledge that has been built up in Agile over the years because uh, it's basically combining the best of both worlds in order to really speed up development projects, but also to do things in a, in a much more structured and better way. Good. Um, I also wanted to kind of touch base with you um, on one of the other crucial elements that you see in project management, and that has everything to do with governance and leadership. So project management methodologies are always very much focused on making sure that a project is, you know, broken down into stages and then there's good controls over which stage we are in. And then the leaders provide um, the, the necessary guidance in order to make sure that the project is being completed. So from all of your project management experience and, and the, the projects that you have been involved on, what are kind of like the, the, the soft skills or the lessons learned from the project management domain that we could take over towards the big data domain? So first of all, if you talk about governance, governance is all about uh, the money and the decision related to the money. And the decision is more likely to be more important. So when it comes to decisions, you need to delegate as much as possible. Delegation requires trust. Trust requires contact. So you have people that you have contact with for a long time. You know these people very well. And because of that knowledge and because of that trust, you actually need to delegate. If you don't delegate, if you keep it centralized, then this is a death sentence to any initiative any uh, big data initiative. This is on one hand. On the other hand, when it comes to leadership, well, when it comes to leadership around the subject of, uh, you know, of uh, big data initiatives, uh, it's like I tell my students in statistics, they, they were complaining to me, you know, first year students, they were complaining, you know, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, you know, why are we uh, so diligent in actually working on formulas? Why do we have all these formulas? Why do we have all these concepts? Why do we have, why do we have? I told them, look, it is not my job as an instructor to teach you what you already can actually uh, learn from books or from look, uh, looking at videos, for example. There are certain recorded videos. I'm only a facilitator, a social facilitator. They said, what is a social facilitator? I said, my job is to put the information in a context that is social, that is important to you. You are human beings. I want to humanize that uh, course to you so that you may understand your responsibility, your social responsibility towards it, and thus be more effective in working on it. Well, this is the same thing in, the, in terms of leadership. I mean, there's been a lots and lots of talks about leadership. Okay, it's, it's all good, it's all good. But by the end of the day, you need to inspire people to do the right thing. It's important to coach them, yes. It's important to teach them, yes. But it is more important to inspire them, to tell them, to, 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 you know, to remind them, actually. You don't need to tell them. To remind them, why are they, why are they doing that? What is so important in working in, in big data projects? I mean, there is a passion behind it. You can imagine, for example, being able to profile a cancer at an early stage, being able to... Uh, for example, uh, you know, shadow a, a, a clinical trial like uh, the COVID-19. Uh, it's a it's a big clinical trial. It's a it's a worldwide clinical trial. So this is very exciting. Until they realize this kind of responsibility, they won't realize this kind of passion. And this is what I consider to be leadership when it comes to initiatives of big data. Yeah. So I'm going to come back towards the leader aspect, ship aspect within a second, but. One of the, the, the key questions that really triggered me is, is how did your students respond to, th to that reply? Because, um, you know, if, if you're young and you're, you know, you're going to university, um, being uh, taught that 
facilitative leadership or, you know, the fact that you, you know, the, the responsibility is with an individual instead of, you know, with the instructor. Just very curious to know how your students took that and, and what their response was to that. Or did they all fill your well, class? Two things. <laughs> well, first of all, I had my, my class uh, overfilled. I, I had to permit uh, some extra students to attend. One, two, uh, they felt, uh, you know, taken care of. Because remember, uh, I'm working with the first, uh, with the first generation that has not actually seen the university yet. These people have been stashed at home for two years. Oh, you know, really? Because of COVID-19. So all the teaching is done remotely yes. and they have never set a foot on the university uh, campus yes. itself. Yes. Yes. Wow. So this was the first time they see the campus and this is, was the first time they see the inside of a classroom. So that was a big step because all of them, all of them are under the impression that we are living desperate times. I mean, uh, they they have used to uh, they've used to you to got used to you know studying in the comfort of their homes, and they were used to uh, you know bad signals you know chaotic signals not receiving good information. So this is was like somebody who is hearing words for the first time. Somebody who was deaf, and he's hearing words and seeing sights for the first time. It is a shock. They were, they are all shocked. And this affects the way they, they understand uh, the, the information. So what I do to them, I say, it's, don't take it that much. I mean, you are human beings. You are learning how to be human. These sciences are helping you to be better human beings. That's it. Nothing more, nothing yeah. less. When you concentrate on that, on, that, uh, you know, on that goal, everything you do in order to get that goal is something which is achievable. Like studying statistics, for example. <laughs> Very good. So... Um, what, what kind of triggers my interest a, a little bit is, is your discussion. You know, you, you've been an educator. You've been uh, also teaching um, from remote uh, locations for the last two years. How are we going to or are, are we going to see an impact on the next generation of leaders who have not been in this face to face contact? And what's your perspective on that? It's actually about allocation. It's about time allocation. What we need to do is we need to allocate more time at teaching or at discussing, in fact, the philosophy of things, and then leave the technical details maybe to a uh, something recorded or you know these boring or technical details. Leave it to something. You know. Let us meet together in order to discuss real problems, in order to decide on strategies, in order to draw roadmaps, roadmaps for solving a statistical problem, for example. Once they understand the, the roadmap behind what they are doing, applying yeah. it would be uh, very simple. That's it. Yeah. So uh, I, staying at home for these two years helped. Yeah, I can imagine. So one of the, the, the people I interviewed earlier said, um, we should make philosophy a mandatory subject for every new student in whatever kind of uh, school they are. Would you, uh, so listening to you, would you agree with that statement or, or do you think uh, that's one step too far? Uh, well, uh, in fact, there are some aspects of philosophy that are very important. I mean, uh, <clears throat> forget about- Which, which ones you know, would that be? Uh, you know, the stoic philosophy. Yeah. That is very important because it actually uh, gives you a, uh, a, a basis for leadership. A leader is someone who doesn't need much, but can offer more. So this is stoic. Sto uh, can you, stoic, can uh, you for, for the, the people who are listening and who might not be familiar with this uh, uh, philosophy, can you ins uh, explain in like one or two minutes what the hand yes. philosophy is all about? The Stoic philosophy is about uh, detaching oneself from uh, earthly or from uh, material uh, ownership and concentrate more on ideas, concentrate more on the uh, general human interests. Uh, so f this, is, this is the type of philosophy I would like to see being taught because the more we are detached from the material, if you want, print, the more we have 
uh, a better insight or a better outlook on the future and the problems that we have at hand. We are not busy thinking about what I'm going to wear, what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to stuff, this and that. Of course, this is very important, but there are far more important things. Um, on the other hand, you also have the philosophy related to uh, economics, the economical philosophy, the basis for, uh, for the philosophical thoughts on uh, economy. This is something that we need to go back to because uh, we have drifted far away from the basics of these general sciences. And in fact, the philosophy of sciences themselves and mathematics, uh, these things actually, you, you know, they are the, uh, uh, they are the raison d'etre, you know, for uh, all the sciences that we are learning. We need to remind ourselves, we need someone to remind us why are we busy learning these things? So that we will yeah. actually know where we, are, we can get to uh, next time. That's it. It's a very, um, I would say, very insightful um, um, recommendation. And I think if we were to, to be able to do that all a little bit more, to kind of detach ourselves from the more material part and, and to start thinking a little bit more uh, around these more worldly problems, then um, it's probably going to be a good thing for entire humankind. Definitely. It also immediately Definitely. forms kind of a nice bridge uh, because um, uh, this week, um, and you might not uh, have been able to avoid this, um, the whole world is uh, watching towards the United Nations Climate Change Conference, which is hosted in, in Glasgow this week. And yes. um, I always kind of like to also relate the, the, the more theoretical things from big data back towards the more day-to-day -day events, because in the end, that's what we're doing it all about. Um, we've been talking about some very interesting uh, concepts already in this um, uh, interview today. We talked about leadership. We talked about project management. We, you talked about uh, governance and, and certain skills that leaders should have. We also talked uh, about the Stoic uh, theory a little bit uh, on, and all of these things are kind of coming together in uh, towards one of these challenges that the world, world is now uh, facing. All of the data is showing us that there is a need to act because otherwise the world will dramatically change within the next few years. Is this something that we can consider a, a big data project or is it something something else? In fact, it is a big data project if you look at one perspective, which is the perspective of sensors. I mean, I mean the sensor input it, uh, alone is enough to be, uh, for that to be considered a big data project. But there is even, uh, something even more, because in this case, sensor data is something that you direct. You need to direct these sensors toward a certain uh, type of data to collect. So not all the sensors, unfortunately, let, let, me, let me be blunt about that. Unfortunately, most of the big, big data is concerned about watching people rather than watching the environment. You know, yeah. uh, in fact, that, uh, you know, uh, this power of uh, monitoring, this monitoring power is directed towards people. It's a sad, uh, it's a sad uh, fact where in fact they should be directed in on what is happening around us, what is happening to the water resources. Many, many countries, they are going to uh, lose water resources soon. Uh, they should be directed towards the, uh, the matter of, you know, they were talking about it yesterday, just yesterday, about the uh, cities that are going to be inundated uh, with water. They talked about many cities that are going to be covered up in water. And some of them actually started, you know, that, they re relocated, I think, they relocated the, uh, uh, the Indonesian uh, capital, I think. Yeah. A, a little while ago. They relocated because of that problem. So, uh, and what is happening in the Maldives? The point is that we have a huge power for monitoring, but we are not putting it in the correct direction. That's the idea. I, I fully agree with you there. Um, and I think it's a very interesting observation, one that I did not hear before. Um, so why do you think that's the case? Why is, is the majority of focus towards monitoring what people are doing instead of the environment? What, what's your view on that? Uh, well, uh, 
unfortunately, we as human beings are more important in uh, doing these little squabbles between us rather than watching what is happening uh, outside in our environment. We always concentrate on competing with each other rather than on cooperating. Whereas yeah. life is all about the balance between these two. Unfortunately, that balance is not present anymore. We are all about competition. We are all about competition. No cooperation whatsoever. And I see it every day. Locally here, I see it every day because, for example, universities are not willing to work together despite the fact that all of them have been negatively impacted by COVID-19. Despite all that, they are still too arrogant, you know, to put their hands together and work together. And this is what we are ha having at a more international level, unfortunately. Oh, and, and I think that that would definitely help us solve some of the more uh, pressing problems. Let me run a, a quick thought experiment by you. So um, um, if I were to kind of um, have all the magic in the world and I could put you in charge as the final decision maker in Glasgow this week, so just as a thought experiment, and you are able to combine your project management experience and all of your knowledge around data and the fact that we would need to observe the environment and not people, what would be your key piece of advice towards the decision makers who are currently there? Or if you were to make a decision today, what would be your first point that you would address? Well, uh, in, in reinforcement learning, the most fascinating thing <laughs> I have worked on was a class of uh, first graders. You know, when, when a child is in first grade, the difference in knowledge that the child has from the beginning until the end of, the, of the, that year is the biggest jump in knowledge that child will ever have in his or her life. So what I would say is that put knowledge where knowledge is due. Uh, give it to uh, schooling systems, have better schooling systems in all countries. If we, if we concentrate on education, uh, and it has been seen, like for example in Singapore, education was the salvation of that country. Otherwise, it wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. So yeah. I would think that would be the salvation for the world. Because what do we have? We have wars caused by ignorance. You will never find a PhD holder who is going to fight in a war. Let alone, <laughs> for example, some people who have some kind of literacy, you know. You know, most people who actually hold guns are illiterate people. This is what I know. It's, it's their only salvage. I mean, this is the only way, this is the only thing that they see. So let us get people, you know, uh, use the, you know, the energy that people have, young people have, in order to have a better education involvement from their uh, childhood in decision making that way i mean uh, um, you know you, you are starting to have some hope for the future because believe me the the whole lot of people nowadays are most most of them are uh, are hopeless <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we still have a long way to go in that area and i think you bring up some interesting points especially on the education front um so one of the difficult parts with education, obviously, is that you would like to get people um, involved. You would like to set up systems that can facilitate that. Um, yet there's only very few countries who are able to manage this in an effective way. You have been in the education industry for two, three decades already. Um, if you were to um, uh, lead that, so suppose that I would, uh, let's say you're not just a decision maker in Glasgow this week, I would also make you the education minister of your country next month. What would be the way that you would um, implement these good ideas? Because I, I truly agree with you that, you know, having good education is probably the most um, uh, or the fastest resolution mm -hmm towards a lot of the world's problems. But what would you do? How, how would you start that? I would make a double flip. You know, the, a double flip. The first yeah. flip is I would, put, I would put older professors in younger, uh, teaching younger generations. 
I would send all university professors all the way back to schools to teach in, in high schools on one hand. On the other hand, I would flip the classroom, involve the student in the learning process, especially nowadays that we have a good repository of uh, data, the good repository of information. Let the student be, uh, you know, let the student come in contact with that. What is sad to me, what is sad to me is to see that, uh, for example, statistics is taught in the same manner and the same means it was taught 20 or 25 years ago by using tables, you know, the normal yeah. distribution table, <laughs> looking at that table, finding Z and alpha. And this is, I mean, come on. I mean, if you don't want to use R or Python, at least use Excel. Yeah. This is a sad, this is a sad fact because now you are diverting the, uh, the width and the intelligence of the students. You are diverting it from the problem into crunching numbers. It is not about crunching numbers. Forget about crunching numbers. There are machines to do that. Our job is to actually appropriate data sets, for example. This is far more important, appropriating data sets and deciding on models, tweaking models, working on parametric studies for models. This is far more important than crunching numbers. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, this is what we have. Yeah, that's what you see. Um, which kind of brings me to, to one other point, and that is also and it's something that we've been seeing in this whole debate, if you can call the debate around uh, climate change as well is what you're seeing is that, I'm, I'm, and I'm just going to kind of label you in, in, in order to kind of use a classification algorithm as in the academic world. So in, in the academic and the scientific world, we are very frequently clashing with the day-to-day the -day reality that people are experiencing. So uh, just to give you a very simple example, sometimes the data tells us very deliberately one thing, yeah that people are doing the exact opposite. Why do you think that that is the case? Uh, <clears throat> mistrust. People, most people don't trust science, unfortunately. And, and why and is that? What, is, what that, is this objection to, towards science? Well, part of that would be the fact that science deals too much with theories rather than with uh, real solution, <clears throat> real solution to real problems. So <clears throat> if you think, for example, about the evolution of uh, the books on statistics, uh, 20 years ago, we used to require students to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, give proof on some mathematical aspects. Now these proofs are not required anymore. They are not required anymore. So. When you still insist on uh, working on the theory itself, I mean, theories, they, they have people specialized for these theories. And theories, they change all the time. They are not constant. So because of this inconsistency, people feel mistrust. When they mistrust science, obviously, they are not going to, uh, you know, to, to, to give it a shot. This is on one hand. On the other hand, mistrust also comes from too much conflicting views. When you have, for example, two people having two conflicting views, most people will not actually attend this, uh, you know, this conversation. They will just be tired of it and then will go, you know, to a different place. So men, usually human, human beings are usually uh, tired of conflict. They run away from conflict. When they see science uh, being, uh, you know, uh, falling in such conflicts, they would actually turn their backs and say, well, Whenever you have a, uh, a proponent, you have a, uh, an opponent. To every proponent, there is an opponent. So forget about that. We, we don't trust science. We are going to go along our merry way. So this is one of, these are two important mechanisms of distrust. Thanks so much for that. I think that's a very, very uh, good and interesting insight. Um, we are slowly but surely, unfortunately, already getting towards the end of an hour. So I kind of need to um, just ha I have a couple of questions left that I wanted to ask you. One of the, the, the main things I'm always very interested in, and especially um, uh, with you, Dr. Kaba, who has had, a, I would say, almost a lifetime of experience in, in this field already. If I were to make you 18 again and uh, you were the, the young 
uh, energetic um, um, Dr. Keve again, or not doctor at that stage, obviously. Um, so if you were 18 or maybe even younger, what would nowadays be your preferred field of study? Would you, would you go into computer science again or would you choose something completely different? Uh, uh, this is in the present time? Not yeah, in, in, in the, the old present time. time. No, in the present time, in, in 2021. Hmm. Well, I would go first in a double major. Double major. Uh, economics and applied mathematics. This is my Good, first Can you explain why? Do a major. Yes. Uh, I would go into a major of economics with a minor in, uh, in, in uh, applied mathematics because uh, the economics are going to give you a general interest in world problems. Because uh, economics is not mainly concerned, it's not only concerned about money. It's not mainly about money, it's about resources, it's about people. On the other hand, applied mathematics is the highest point of entry I would consider to the world of big data. It would give you a basic and rudimentary understanding of that. Once I finished that, I would go through a career, a short career, for example, like uh, three to five years career as a, an economical analyst. Once I finished with that, I would do a master's degree in, uh, in uh, either applied management science or in big data whatever uh, name you give to, to, to big data or econometrics, for example, all of these are actually going into the same direction eventually. Once I finish that, I would go back again into consultancy and work on, uh, on data consultancies. Then eventually I would do a PhD in whatever I can think about. Because in this case, the title of the PhD is not the concern anymore. The title of the dissertation is the concern. That way, I would actually apply it in whatever I consider to be a, an important problem to solve. This is, uh, this is me thinking about a fresh start. Well, and I, I would get married if, uh, sooner. <laughs> well, I, I think that especially for... Uh, we have quite a, a number of very young listeners. Um, so I think this is excellent advice. And... Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you get some letters uh, after the show today from people who uh, are going yes, to say that welcome. they followed your advice within this area. Good. I have uh, one kind of final question uh, uh, to ask you, and um, I really enjoy, you know, having these kinds of conversations with you. Uh, we've obviously been completely off script again. Um, and I'm, I'm really inspired by uh, listening to you and, and, and your knowledge. And um, I can obviously see that you have a wealth of experience in, in teaching. So in May of next year, uh, we're intending to host uh, our next big data conference. And uh, I would be very keen to, uh, to ask you as a speaker for a one hour lecture. Will you accept my invitation? Very gladly. I'm, I'm, I'm even more keen and more interested in that. It's very nice. I mean, I have seen the audience of, I have had a peek at the audience of uh, big data. In very interesting people. I mean, uh, the mere fact that they are there to discover, they have this love for discovery. That's, that's, uh, that's it for me. Yeah, well, I, I think that that is something that unites all of us, this fascination for the unknown the fascination for a lot of uh, discovering new things, new ideas. And that's also what makes it such a great uh, pleasure to talk to you in an interview like this. Thank you. Unfortunately, Dr. Kevin, uh, we are slowly getting towards uh, the end of our hour. So I would like to really thank you so much in participating in this Big Data Talks. It's really been an absolute pleasure to have you here and your your words of wisdom and your years of experience are greatly appreciated, um, both for myself, but also towards all of our listeners from across the world. I really hope it inspires others to, to think in different well, ways. Thank you for bringing me back to 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I really hope it inspires others to start shifting the way they think and also to see 
how data can fundamentally change their lives because ultimately that's the whole idea of this show and this podcast is to make sure that we provide some industry minds to kind of provide this bigger perspective. And if we're accomplishing that, I think we're, uh, we really have the ability to move forward. So thank you so much for your contribution today uh, and um, hope that um, you have a positive impact on the way in which big data is changing the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Kebe. I hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The honor is mine.